Hello everybody. I'm here today with Ian Freeman, Free Talk Live Radio. I was really fortunate to get to sit in on uh, a recording last night with you guys, or a, a, a live broadcast with you guys, and it was a really, really enjoyable show. Thanks. So, you guys should check it out if you haven't heard of it. But I'll, I'll, rather than I rambling on, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody and just sort of talk about what, what you're doing out here. Uh, well, um, do you want me to talk to you or the camera? You can just talk to me, that's okay, fine. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Ian Freeman. Um, I'm the host of Free Talk Live. I'm the founder and blogger, one of the main bloggers at freekeen.com, uh, which is a blog that's been here based out of Keene, New Hampshire, for more than a decade now since I moved here in 2006, which was part of the Free State Project, uh, which of course is this migration, one of a couple different migrations of libertarians and voluntarists and anarchists who are converging here in New Hampshire and doing more activism, more successful activism than has I've ever been seen in the, the entire liberty movement in my opinion. So those are some of the things I do. I program LRN.FM, which is a Liberty Radio Network, 24-7 streaming audio. I do a lot of Bitcoin activism here in the local area, promoting Bitcoin to local businesses. And you have a lot of local businesses here that use Bitcoin and accept Bitcoin, I should say. Yes, uh, more than per capita in Keene, New Hampshire than anywhere else in probably the United States, maybe the whole world. They say San Francisco is number one, but Keene per capita beats San Francisco, so we actually have a bunch of businesses yeah, here. Yeah, that's really awesome. You can go out in town and just use Bitcoin to pay for regular things. That's Yep, and you're, we're about to do that coming up here in, uh, in an hour. So that's right, that's right, that the local burger. One of the businesses that accepts Bitcoin. Yeah, it's pretty fun to do that, and most people can't do that where they live, or right. have to travel a ways to get right. to a place that, that they can do that. And the reason we, we've had success is because of that concentration of activists. Mm -hmm. If it was just me, it wouldn't have been as effective because, you know, if you're just one person going into a business asking about Bitcoin, mm -hmm. then they're just going to blow you off. But if you're the third person who's asked about Bitcoin, then that business owner might start to right. really consider it. Strength in numbers there. Yeah. And did you say to me that some 2,000 people have openly like moved here, to, declared to be moving here because of... Not to Keene, but to New Hampshire. To New Hampshire. Yeah. The Free State Project claims uh, 2,000 what they call early movers. They hit their goal of 20,000 people who pledged to move. That was a year ago that they hit that goal. So uh -huh. people have been moving over the last decade as early movers, and now they're Finally, their big move is supposed to be happening, so more people should be should be coming so over the next big, five years. This is a time period allocated a time. for a big, yeah. big move. And we're just now, when we're recording this, we're leaving. You know, winter's finally over, and so when things warm up, more people are more likely to move. Yeah. So we should see hopefully another couple, few hundred people move up here. Yeah. And uh, and then there's also the Shire Society, which I helped uh, to found. A number of the Free Staters who moved here at uh, Pork Fest, which is a yearly camping festival that happens here. Uh, in 2010, we founded the Shire Society with this Shire Society Declaration, and it's basically a personal declaration of independence. It's like a, okay. it's like a voluntarist state. I can get behind that. And, uh, and it's nice. It's, uh, it's really nice. It was actually inspired by L. Neil Smith's writings. We, we modified it over a period of weeks and came up with a final document. Dobby Barker from Muslims for Liberty did like a, a nice calligraphy version on hemp paper, sort of like, you know, the original Declaration of Independence. Yeah. But this is for your own person, sort of declaring your own independence from the state, mm -hmm. uh, from that concept. And uh, so a bunch of us signed that, and we created this alternative society, a society of peace and of voluntarism. And so there's the Shire Society is also encouraging people to move here. So if somebody doesn't like the Free State Project because they disagree with their board of directors and some of the decisions they've made, that's okay. We've got a whole other you know movement that's mm -hmm. completely decentralized. Uh, Shire Society has no board of directors. It's just there's this declaration. If you agree with it, you can sign it. You can sign it privately, publicly, however you want to sign it. Um, you can print it out at home. You can sign it online. Mm -hmm. And then you're encouraged to move to where the other Shire people are because if we get people who believe in voluntarism, believe in liberty together, amazing things become possible. Totally, and you can start to see progress even within the existing system. If enough people are living in an area, that system can be utilized to serve real ends, I would imagine. The system is, you know, unwieldy, it's slow, it's politics. I mean, politics is terrible. Right. Um, but I still, look, when I moved here, I was pretty burned out on 
politics because I was working with the Libertarian Party down in Florida and see no progress you know, whatsoever. No matter how much time and energy and money you put into it, nothing would ever change. The vote totals wouldn't change, the amount of people involved wouldn't change. But here, um, there's actual, like you can make a difference uh, within the political system here. And that's going to turn some people on, it's not going to turn some people on, and that's right. fine. There's some people who move here and they're like total agora, total, you know, agorist, yeah. working underground, and that's cool. So there's, you know, everybody can do whatever they, their heart really yeah. calls them to do here. Sure, and you know, to have the agorist, I think we need both approaches, honestly. Yeah. I, I've always had to stay in the agora. I can't, I can't function very well in the, 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 the Thai kind of society. Um, I'm with you. I won't put on a tie. I, I know, and it's just like, and just that what all that represents. It's just like I can't do it. But I'm sure glad that there are people who can. And what I would love to see is more collaboration amongst us all, so that we can serve roles. And but I guess what I'm what I'm trying to figure out here, though, is with so many people in an area that do believe these kinds of things, are you seeing a change in the policy that the governments are enacting? Are you seeing a, a difference in how the government? reacts to the people. Yes, um, and here we've had real success stories in the political sense. So libertarian types who've been politically active in other places don't understand success because it never happened. So we were talking before the battery died about uh, some of the success stories that have happened sort of inside the system, and there's a lot of them. I couldn't possibly go over all of them, but uh, early on, I mean years ago, there was a free stater who got elected uh, to state representatives who put forward a bill that would legalize all knives. I mean, New Hampshire's always been a pretty friendly, uh, pro-defense kind of place. Yeah. But there were a couple uh, types of knives that were you know, prohibited or whatever. I don't know if it was butterfly knives or whatever it mm -hmm. was, but now any knife is completely legal to possess in New Hampshire. So that was one of the earlier yeah. uh, success stories. Uh, constitutional carry just passed this year, uh, which is the ability to conceal carry a, a gun without asking permission. So mm -hmm. the, the permit still exists if you want to get a permit, um, but they it's no longer required. Yeah. So New Hampshire is now one of the is now the you know one of the top freest states as far as your freedom to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. um, there have been other, you know, success stories where political successes, people have been elected who are actually libertarians. So like that alone is something that's pretty unusual, right? Because libertarians everywhere else are lucky to get three percent. In this case, they've run as Republicans and Democrats, but we actually have like anarcho-capitalist type voluntarist people who are really in the state house here. Mm -hmm. Now, the New Hampshire state house has four hundred uh, state representatives. There's four hundred of them, so it's actually the third largest legislative body in the Western world. Um, far more state representatives here than in, in all the other 50 states, and that uh, that uh, that means that each of those state representatives is representing, you know, I know that they're not representing us, but regardless, they are representing a much smaller group of people, mm -hmm. so they really are more likely to be your neighbors, and this is a place where they only get $100 a year, so in a lot of states, they're getting full salaries. Here, it doesn't, you know, they get $100 a year and like The incentive stuff. isn't there to... Right. They're not professional politicians. Yeah, to be professional politicians. They're not lawyers, most of them. Uh -huh. um, and that, that, you know, makes it more of a citizen legislature. Now, we don't like, you know, the idea of the state at all, but if a state is going to exist, I'd rather have the politicians making $100 a year than right. making 30000 or 70000 or, you know, and having staffs. They get a locker, they don't have a an office. They don't have a secretary or anything. Do they get like a cafeteria lunch? There's a cafeteria. <laughs> yeah. There is a cafeteria run by a private company um, in the in the state house. Wow. So it's a different. It's thing. Interesting though. It's a different vibe. And when like I go every week actually with Daryl Perry, who's the Liberty lobbyist. He just started this thing where he's like a crowd-funded lobbyist for Liberty who goes in and he does put a suit on, but he won't wear a tie either. And he goes in there and he speaks in favor of freedom on a bunch of different bills. Because in New Hampshire, they have to have a public hearing on every proposed bill. Even the craziest, you know, bill proposed by <laughs> Dick Marple, this guy who I was telling you off the air about, yeah. who like, you know, challenges the court system's jurisdiction. This guy yells at everybody. <laughs> he puts forward some crazy sounding bills, like to what most people think. Mm -hmm. I love him. I, you know, he's like, wants to get rid of uh, the DMV or whatever. Yeah. You know, 
things. So like every bill, no matter how zany it might be, has to receive a public hearing. They have to listen to the public and what they have to say. Mm -hmm. Now you would say, of course, well, they're politicians. They've got their mind made up. But you'd actually be surprised how many of them will come up and like thank you. Yeah. Like, if you go up and you speak uh, on some bill, they'll say thanks. And they appreciate what you said. Daryl has had some of his suggestions that he's made for amending uh, bills accepted. Like mm. they've taken his idea and put them in his amendments. That's and made bills better. That's really cool, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, if there ever are cases of the people utilizing their government to do what they want in their community, because that's to me the only legitimate use of that sort of administrative body of people who are making decision making policy. They have to be doing it on the behalf of everyone that's around, and that seems like something that is. A, a myth that that doesn't really exist. It and really I guess it doesn't. It, it doesn't. In most places. But the fact that there are success stories for it here does speak a lot for the kind of citizenry you have and the kind of style of government that's being produced here. Well, if you think about, yeah, if you've ever tried to, let's say, contact a state representative in most places, they don't want to hear from you. I imagine you know, not, yes. They, uh, they have gatekeepers, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's answering the phones, making sure you can't talk to the state representative. The only time a state rep in another state, most of them will want to talk to you is during campaign season. Uh -huh. Then they're your buddy because they want your vote. But uh, as soon as they get elected, it's like close the doors, you know, lock yeah. everybody out. But here, if you go on the state website, they give you contact information for all the state reps. Nine times out of ten, when you pick up the phone and you call the number for the state rep, it's their home phone number. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's their cell phone number. So it's a kind of a weird experience to, like, okay, I want to call the state rep about the marijuana bill. Yeah. Dial the phone number. Hello. Yeah. Can you put me on with your mom? Because uh. their kid answered the phone, right? Like, there's no gatekeeper here. You're literally connecting directly to these people. That's cool. And they're more likely to to pay attention. They're more likely to listen. Yeah. And when you go to some of the liberty events here, you'll see them if you know who they are. State rep. State rep. State rep. Right. State rep. State. So the fact is that like. The, the state reps here, they know the Liberty community is this valuable activist community. Mm -hmm. They don't want to upset them because you don't want these activists working against you. Right. For, they can um, smear you. Right. There's a third, uh, one more point about politics because I know there's no, no sure. focus here. But, um, there's the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance that was formed by a bunch of the movers, people that migrated here, and New Hampshire natives. And this is an unprecedented group because what they do is they actually try to read all of the proposed legislation that comes out. And it's like 800 bills, right? Like, it's a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of it's bad because, you know, there's still bad politicians. But, you know, there's some really good stuff, too. And so what they do is they have a rating system where they've got volunteers who love to read bills. I can't handle it. What, right? what, uh, not, what are you going to do this weekend? It's not oh, for me. Got some bills I'm going to read. <laughs> there are those people. Uh, I guess. And they moved here and they, you know, read hundreds of bills and they rate them and they say, well, this bill would be pro-liberty if it passed or this bill would be anti-liberty. And and, uh, and then the, this organization, the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, comes out with what they call their gold standard, which is a, a sheet where every week before the state representatives come in and do their voting, and they only do it for a few months out of the year, so not, they're not there the whole year. Mm -hmm. um, but every every week, they stand there and they hand these out to all 400 state reps as they come in. So each state rep is getting two different sets of voting recommendations. They're getting voting recommendations from their party, so where the Democrats or the Republicans tell them, if you want to be a good Republican, you got to vote like this. Mm -hmm. Well, this New Hampshire Liberty Alliance is saying, if you want to vote for liberty, this is how you should vote. And they're giving them those recommendations as they go in. Mm -hmm. So they've become a real influence. And they'll even grade the politicians. So at the end of the year, they come up with a report card based on how these guys voted. Wow. And they like they run the numbers and they say, well, did he vote good on this? Did they vote good on this? And then they come up with A, B, C, D, or F. Or yeah. then there's below F, there's constitutional threat. You don't want to get below F. But, right. Um, and then they, they give awards out and like the top you know, do do senators or yeah. representatives vie for the, the 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 good ratings? Some of them do. They yeah. they, they think it matters. It has, yeah, absolutely. That's really cool. Absolutely. That's so, really interesting. So the thing things are very different here, just yeah. from from that perspective. It's yeah. very, much more accessible to the average person, and that has had I think that's been a reason why New Hampshire's government is small compared to the other states. It's still bad. You know, it's still hurting peaceful right. people. There's still a war on drugs. You know, there's still stuff happening here that we need to work on. Yeah. But I think we're having an effect. That's great. I mean, and that's 
It's commendable work because most people don't want to do it. Most people look at the system and they're just like, it's so messed up that we can never, we can never recover. And but no one else, no one knows what else to do. And move to New Hampshire. <laughs> that's that's what you can do because, and that's why this the fetus, you know, I don't know what to do attitude is so prevalent within the liberty movement. Um, you know, I'm from Florida originally, and I've seen the, the failures. I've seen the uh, inability to, you know, do anything of any kind of real right. relevance. And here, there's there's a community. Like here in, in Florida, where I'm from, it was like maybe a dozen people, if you were lucky, would show up at a Libertarian Party meeting, and that was like a good one. That was like during election season, average meeting, probably like five to ten, um, and everybody just complains. You know, they just sit around and complain about how bad things are. Like. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about it? Well, we don't have enough people to do anything about it. Well, here you've got more people than you can even know. There's more libertarians that live in this house and the house across the street than there was in Sarasota, Florida in total. Uh, and so having those numbers allows you to have community and some of the things that are not political that I mentioned to you off the air, one of them is like they have these market days, which anyone who loves the agro is going to love this. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they find like a, a somebody with a big house or like somebody who has access to a, a large room that they can rent or whatever, and people will come in, set up tables, and mm. you know bring out whatever craft that they make, like you know homemade soaps or yeah. you know homemade beer or whatever it is, and uh, weed, you know anything, yeah. and uh, they bring it there. It's the Agora. Yeah, and they and they sell to their neighbors, and that's something that the Liberty communities in different places like Manchester, where they have a lot of people have been able to do and do successfully on like a monthly or bi-weekly basis. Yeah. So there's like real kind of community building stuff and a lot of social events that go on here. So there's more than just the political activism right. or like the civil disobedience that has made headlines. I mean, we've definitely had some pretty epic civil disobedience and things like that here. But then there's just the quieter stuff where families get together mm -hmm. and you know, build community or homeschooling groups and all of that stuff. Nice. We have the people. And if you have the numbers, then you can have influence over media. So we create our own media here as well. Like you're sitting in my studio, obviously, but there's a studio out on the seacoast that was just built last year, and they're producing radio shows out there, or podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, there have been people who've done television shows. There's a guy here in Keene, one of the early movers, who has a show that he does weekly on the cable access channel. Mm. Um, so Daryl Perry, who you met earlier, he's got a newspaper that he publishes and distributes around town. So like we're hitting, you know, we create our own media. We're we're talked about in the mainstream media too because we're effective. Yeah. But we're also creating our own media so we can actually get our own word out to, to people about freedom. And we're starting in a place, New Hampshire, live free or die, where the native population already kind of gets it. Yeah. And that's helpful. It's hard to really express how helpful that is. Like doing it in New Hampshire versus California. Oh yeah. It's a world of difference. I, right? I can imagine. I can only imagine. New Hampshire is already the number one most free state. If you look at the Freedom in the Fifty States uh, study, mm -hmm. there's uh, the Cato Institute. I think took it over. It was started by the Mercatus Center, but last year Cato did it, and they run the numbers from all the fifty states and different categories and you know, freedom in different areas, and New Hampshire number one. So we've got that starting point of already being the freest of the, the states. Yeah. And now we've got the, these migrations, these active migrations of volunteers coming in here. Yeah. I mean, how can that not have an effect? Well, I am looking forward to seeing what an effect it's going to have. And, and you know, I already I can see, having gone around a little bit today, some of the effect of just the, the environment here is totally what you're describing. There's a lot of people who are thinking outside of the box and just doing what they're doing with good, with the right intention, with with how do I say it? Like, with pride, you know, people are happy to be making a living the way they're making a living. Versus, a lot of what's available to us in the mainstream world, it's not something we're super proud of, or that we like are all that into. Even we don't have options to do what we love and feel that being in a place that's community, locally oriented, that's what it's all about. That's what you do in a village setting. You, you, what, if you move to a village, well, what do you do, my friend? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're a baker. Excellent. And that's real. That's a real thing in New Hampshire because the communities here tend to be very small. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the big city here is Manchester, and that's got 100,000 people in it. Um, everything else, you know, pales in comparison. I mean, yeah. Nashua, 70,000, Concord, 40,000, then you start getting down into the 20,000s. You know, it's not, not a big place, most places in, in New Hampshire. Yeah. 
and and that helps because not just is the not only is the liberty community great and very strong here, but the wider community is also a very kind of flinty, independent, real like you know, they call them the granite staters for a reason. Mm -hmm. They're a tough bunch. I mean, the winners here are a little tough sometimes for, for folks. Yeah. They're not as bad as they are in like uh, Minnesota or something like that. They're yeah. actually not as not as bad, but uh, you know it gets cold, and so the people here are pretty uh, pretty tough. Well, that's a big aspect of liberty. If we want to be free, we have to be tough. We it's have to be self-reliant. Yeah, and it's one of the things that scares people away from, from New Hampshire. Sure. And, cool and I think that that is a good thing. Because Listen. if somebody says, and, and for me it was the thing I had to get over. I mean, I'm a skinny kid from Florida. Florida, right? yeah. Um, I get cold. If it's 70 degrees, I'm, my feet are cold, right? Yeah. Like, I, I get cold. But to me, the community here is unmatched, and the activism here is unprecedented, mm -hmm. and so all of that makes it worth it. And we have heat. You know, there's heat, heating, you know, little heating hand warmer things, and you know, parkas or whatever you need, down mittens if you need that. So warm. Um, so you can definitely, you know, warm up, and uh, and it's the warmth of the community that's really mm -hmm. unprecedented and unmatched. But if somebody says, "Oh, it's too cold. I don't want to move to New Hampshire," well. Good luck, because you're going to need it uh, wherever you are. I mean, the status like it warm, too. And eventually, think about this. If you get enough liberty people in one place where the status are just getting frustrated at every turn, they're trying to pass, you know, trying to pass a seatbelt law. We don't have that in New Hampshire. But they never succeed, you know. They, they, they just can't get it to happen here. Even though the federal government's going to give millions of dollars to the state, they still keep saying no to it in New Hampshire. And so if the status keep losing, and you know, every now and then they win because they're still out there, but if they keep losing, they're going to get frustrated. And then they're going to be like, well, Florida sure does look Another nice. Another exodus. Yeah. <laughs> An opposite exodus. Yeah. Well, we've actually seen that happen. There, yeah. there was one lady who lived out in Westmoreland uh, who used to write articles for Counterpunch, anti-free stater articles, uh, Counterpunch is a website. And uh, she, she's gone. She sold her house. She moved. There was a guy who owned a coffee shop downtown here who came out and assaulted somebody uh, once, Sam Dodson, one of the uh, earlier movers, assaulted him with his coffee cup, and it was a ridiculous video. If you search freekeen.com for coffee cup, uh, you'll, you'll find it. Okay. But this guy, he's gone. He sold his business, and he, he left town. Uh -huh. So like some of the arch status who've been the loudest against uh, the movement here have gone. And the more difficult it's going to get for them, more liberty people move here, the yeah. harder it's going to be for them to succeed at doing statism. And they're just going to be like, well, New York's not that far. And New York, of course, is a perfect place for a statist. Or, or Massachusetts. Or New Jersey. You know, all these places. Yeah. You can get out. Well, I'm personally very attracted to the idea of creating an alternative to that statist and debt consumer slave lifestyle that so many people are in and I think want out of. I think people are most a lot of people spend a lot of time on the internet looking at other things elsewhere in the world cool things that they would rather be doing and that's to me a market that's a demand that needs to be filled with infrastructure for people to move on out yep. and be free and we have opportunity that, yeah we found that if you build it they come yeah so like if somebody buys a house like a multifamily uh, like this house it's yeah multifamily um, it's not hard because people do want to come here once you kind of put it out there like, hey, I've got rooms for rent, people fill it up. Right. So the house across the street's got four rooms and they're all four filled with, uh, with liberty-friendly folks. Some of them are more active than others. So like some people like to be out in front in the media, yeah. running for office. Other people like the more quiet roles of maybe administering a website or writing a letter to the editor. You know, doing the kind of important tasks that don't have the glory associated with yeah. them, but are the, the you know the gears that need to turn uh, to make this stuff happen. And so we need all of the approaches, like you were saying earlier. Yeah. And so we got to get the word out there, people. Come on out to New Hampshire and check it out, because yeah. it seems like this is exactly what it's going to take in order to change the system is for it to be done at a local level to where it has some form of legitimacy. Because if you just defy the state and break rules on your own property, they come out and they pop you and nobody seems oh, to care. You. But yeah. if a whole city does it, are they going to come crush a whole city with the state or the National Guard? 
I don't think they will. I think it looks bad on right. their part. Right. And there's a big secession movement here. Um, I mean, not as big as I'd like it to be, but it's you know yeah. it's burgeoning, and uh, and that's because of a lot of people that have moved in here. But when I when I've done outreach to New Hampshire natives, the people who you know been here a long time, we've got those flat. You know, I showed you one of the flyers last night yeah. from the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence. I've been at this county fair, just you know, with a uh, with a booth that I bought, and you know, flyering people, and. Just watching people look at the flyer, a big smile spreads across their <laughs> face, and like they get it, you know, like they love these ideas. You know, they love the ideas of freedom here in, in, in New Hampshire. Yeah. And I think this is really that, that place that we can start. And getting people to move is a hard thing to do. I mean, we've been for years on my show talking about all the success stories and putting them out there, but people have jobs, they got careers, they got families. It's a big commitment to uproot yourself mm -hmm. and move to another place. But if you think about it, that's what it's going to take. It's going to take people that have that level of commitment. Because if your level of commitment to freedom is just to post on Facebook, you're fucked. You're not going to be free for very long. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's going to be over at yeah. some point. Because yeah. if your level of commitment is, I'm willing to move where other people are also moving and do something, then you're going to see success, yeah. and you're going to have that community. You talked about, you know, breaking some rule here. We don't have an entire town willing to do that yet, but if somebody does some civil disobedience, you can count on the fact that people are going to be in court to support you. You know, normally if you do something somewhere else, you're lucky if your mom comes to, comes yeah. to court with you, right? Uh, here, I'm going to show up, if you're in Keene, I'm going to show up with my video camera and record the whole thing. We're going to have people there. When you have enough people in a courtroom and the, the bailiff comes in and says, all rise, and they don't. That's a cool thing. That is an, like. Have you seen just, that? Oh, all the time. Oh, that's yeah. great. I love that. To buy uh, that stupid yeah. system, that theater they have. Right. And, and doing it in front of the, the regular folks who are in there yeah. is really interesting because like sometimes they'll schedule our trials when no one else is there because they know we're going to stay to hide seated. From you. They, well, they oh, oh yeah, they right. make it sure that y'all are the only people in the audience. Right. They don't want any of the average folks who would be in court to see that happen Bears themselves. because what has happened is if we're in the court, let's say there's a dozen liberty people who show up, not uncommon. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, I've seen 20 to 40 people show up for different people's trials, like a name of Friedman from Coplock.org. Yeah. We had we had the courtroom full of people, and that it changes the entire feel. Like normally, if you're in court, everybody's quiet. Mm -hmm. Nobody says anything. It's, it's like you're in some sort of solemn religious thing, right? Like got, they've got pews. There's a exactly. man in a robe. Uh, I mean, it's a crazy religion, the state, really. Yeah, right? It's, it's designed to make you be quiet and listen and do right. what you're told. But with 40 people. We had applause when a demo would, you know, make a point, and the judge would do something stupid, or the state, you know, oh, state wow. witness would say something dumb. People were laughing, like it was like a complete changes like the, the vibration of it. The and you're whole filming thing, it. Yeah, I've got all that on, on video. Oh right? man, I gotta see that. The whole the, the whole feel changes. But even if you don't have the supermajority of the courtroom, even if you just have, let's say, ten or, yeah, or a dozen people. Yeah, got a small people, crew of people who are going to make some noise. What you'll see happen is, if those people stay seated as the judge comes in, well, not only is it like a personally empowering thing to, to go against the grain like that, it's like, yeah. yeah, we just did that, you know, like that felt good. If you watch around you, other people will stay seated too. Like people like, who you don't know, yeah. people who were there for their own court case, who otherwise would stand and sit when they're told to. Yeah. If there's enough of us there, it'll spread, and other people will stay seated. I've been in courts where we've been close to half of the courtroom, and we stay seated, the rest of the courtroom stays seated. The only people who stand are the people getting paid by the state. So the prosecutor and you know those people, yeah. they stand. Everybody else stays seated. Ooh, it's that's very the undermining of there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's gotten to the point, Eric, where if we're in court in Keene, where we've been more than anywhere else, right? Because uh -huh. this is where the civil disobedience has happened for the most part, with a few exceptions. So this court has had more visits from Liberty people than anywhere else. If they know we're in court, they won't even say, I'll rise. The judge just walks in and takes a seat. Yeah. They won't say it. And they're doing that on purpose because they don't want people to see it happen. So yeah. they just figure if we just the judge just walks in, we don't say all right. Doesn't embarrass them to that. Exactly. 
it's interesting. The because they, they they need their authority to be believed. Oh, they, yeah. they they need people to believe that they're the boss. And right. This whole system is legitimate, and we have to yes, a boss, and you know, kowtow, and that's the illusion. That's, so that's the trick. So that's another big success, right? You want yeah. to talk about, and that's kind of like a in the system success that was because of people out of the system, right? Like we've changed the system the way they react to us uh -huh. by being free people yeah. and acting like free people and not kowtowing to them and not standing when they say stand mm -hmm. they've changed how they behave i think that's a, that's, that's amazing that's a really yeah. really powerful thing to have to see happen so good work man <laughs> and that's you know again we're just getting started yeah. you know that's with a dozen people yeah you know in this imagine scenario. Hundreds and the halls are packed and the courtroom is surrounded and that's what I want to see happen for people like uh, Ross Fulbert. It's like I want to see swarms of people going to the prison and demanding his release. Well, guess who? Guess who went down to the uh, the courthouse uh, during the Ross Ulbricht trial and held signs out front? Not me because I had to stay here to do the radio okay. show, but a couple of my co-hosts from Free Talk Live and a handful of the folks from Keen. There was a Keen contingent outside of uh, the, the Ulbricht trial. In fact, at the very beginning of the trial, I don't know how closely you followed it. I didn't follow it super closely. In the very beginning, um, you know, our guys and a couple of folks from Philly, so Jim Babb from Philly was up there, um, were out there with jury notification information. Jury, you know, like signs that said like, you know, 30 years for a website, you know, like yeah. trying to bring to the jurors the reality of what they could possibly be doing to this person. Hi everybody, I'd like to apologize for the end of this video which just cuts off before we completed the conversation. I don't know what happened. The battery died when we plugged in the camera and then I guess it shut itself off. I need a better camera for videos obviously, but I'm working with what I have at the moment. But I was pretty close to the end of this video when it shut off. Ian and I were about to wrap up our conversation. I don't remember exactly what else we concluded other than to say, I should say this, he went on to say that the judge cleared out the courtroom at the very beginning and told Ross Ulbricht's representation, his family, whoever, that if those people with their protest signs and their jury nullification information don't get out of here, then they're going to – I can't remember what exactly they threatened, but like something real bad, like lock him up in solitary or not. They're going, oh, I know what it was. They were going to sequester the jury. So that the jury thinks that maybe Ross is like some gangster and they're being threatened and that's why they had to be sequestered because he's coming after them or something. It was a scare tactic. And it essentially worked. The family and the, the, the defense knew what it was about, but they still didn't want any more trouble. So they asked the activist that Ian was describing to please not come back, which is sad and yet it's telling of how afraid – the system is of people finding out about this stuff about jury nullification about the fact that we the people actually have the right to just shove all these guys out of the way and say you guys don't get to just put people in jail for nothing and there are still ways within our current legal system for the people to stand up for each other that way rapidly changing so we got to use this while we have it but anyhow that was about the end of our conversation and then we said our goodbyes and that's the end of the video so i apologize for my camera cutting out on us and shortening that, but hope you enjoyed the video and there's lots more coming, so stay tuned everybody.